Stem Cell Podcast, Accelerating Stem Cell Treatments with Dr. Maria Milan. Hey everybody, we are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. You may remember that we announced a contest to win one of three Stem Cell Podcast branded Bluetooth speakers back in August to celebrate our bi stem 200th episode. Well, the contest has wrapped up and we'd like to congratulate the winners, Junji Liu at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Giannis Lazis at the Institute of Biomedical Research of Belvich, and Shivani Gupta at the University of Zurich. Thank you for listening to the podcast and we hope you're gonna enjoy those speakers. If you got them already, may wanna plug them in and pump it up because today we have Dr. Maria Milan from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine She's on the podcast to talk about the Institute's work, accelerating stem cell treatments to patients with unmet needs. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news that's coming right up. But first, looking to stay current with the latest research and news in the fields of immunology and cell biology, we'd like to remind our listeners to check out Stem Cell Science News, featuring the most recent top peer-reviewed research and review papers, as well as industry policy and science news. Stem Cell Science News provides a platform that allows researchers to stay up to date with their field while saving time. Subscribe for free at stemcellsciencenews.com. And indeed, we are very excited to have one of the architects of CIRM and one of the leaders of CIRM and Dr. Milan here on the show today. But before we get to our chat with her, we're going to talk, of course, about some recent papers that have come out in the stem cell field. And uh, the first couple of papers that we're going to discuss have to do with mechanotransduction. All right. And part of the reason that I think this is a relevant topic is, of course, the Nobel Prize for Medicine from this year, 2021, was awarded to Drs. J David Julius and Dr. Uh, Artem Pataputian, both uh, in California, Dr. Julius at UCSF and Dr. Pataputian, Pataputian at Scripps, I believe, for you know, their work on mechanotransduction. In fact, Dr. Pataputian's work focuses on the piezo channels, which we'll be talking about in uh, the couple of round of papers that we're covering here. And Dr. Julius is involved as well in this in this area. So it's a certainly an extremely hot field. It's a field that's worthy of celebration, worthy of prize, as was awarded this year. So the first paper I'm actually going to talk about is titled Mechanoreceptor Synapses in the Brainstem Shape the Central Representation of Touch. And indeed, we're talking about mechanotransduction, touch. Uh, this is a cell paper coming out of the lab of Dr. David Ginty at Harvard. The first author is Brendan Leonard. So, of course, you know, when it comes to touch, the sensations of touch, it kind of varies between species, right? For humans in particular, our hands and our lips are really sensitive, and this makes them really critical in our ability to figure out our world around us, and this is critical to our survival, too. I'm sure it impacted how our ancestors were able to survive in the wild, right? And so this touch sensation, which is extremely powerful, is something that is actually shifting and changing over the course of our development and over the course of human maturation. And one question is, how do the connections between the sensory neurons in our skin, and in particular, the really sensitive parts of our skin and the brain, how do they, how, how do these connections actually work? And how do they uh, come about and how do they change over maturation and how do these connections result in these really sensitive portions of the skin that we have. So these folks were able to publish a paper in Cell that shows that there's an overrepresentation of these sensitive skin surfaces in the brain that develops during early adolescence and that the cool thing is this can actually be pinpointed to the brainstem. So these sensory neurons that are actually populating the more sensitive parts of the skin and relaying info to the brain form actually more connections and stronger connections than neurons in say portions of the skin that have a lot of hair in them. Uh, this is something that again, changes over the, the maturation of the human, right? And how did they figure this out? They did a ton of really beautiful imaging in this paper, live imaging of neurons in mice. That is one of the limitations of this paper is, you know, they're making these infer you know, inferences uh, 
uh, connections and these conclusions based on a mouse model. And as we know, the skin populations and the overall percentages of the sensitive skin in mice may be very different uh, between human, right? So we know human uh, lips and human palms, as I mentioned, are really sensitive. But what about mice? I actually don't work with mice that much. So I don't know what the most sensitive portions of their body are, but that is certainly a consideration here. And this is something they did mention in their study. So uh, in addition to be a, a really cool basic science finding this, this shift in the proportion of sensitive neurons, quote unquote, sensitive neural connections over time, uh, this could also be really useful in helping to understand different neurodevelopmental disorders. People have uh, disorders that leads to alterations in the way they perceive the world and perhaps even skin sensitivity, touch uh, desensitization. These are all actual neurodevelopmental disorders that real people have to unfortunately experience. So it's a, you know, bringing a basic science study about neurodevelopment to perhaps a translational focus down the road at some point. But honestly, yes, the main reason I wanted to highlight this paper, and I'm sure part of the reason you wanted to pick your paper, was the, the current events in, the, in not only the stem cell field, but also the scientific field as a whole. Of course, the, the yearly awarding of the Nobel Prizes this year, focusing on this topic of mechanic transduction. Yeah, and it's I, I also just fundamentally, I think um, not enough thought is spent on on you know, sense, touch as a, an acquired sense. You know, we, we, we think of vision usually because it's lost or hearing, um, but touch because, you know, there's not a lot of like, oh, I lost my sense of touch diseases, but there are a lot of pathologies as you, as you rendered there that are, you know, all across the spectrum from mild to severe. My own son, little wolfy boy, he hates the sound of, you know, the, the ski jacket, this sound. Here I'm wearing a jacket because it's freezing. He hates that sound. Um, so we have to turn all his coats inside out. It's a huge pain in the ass. But um, so that's my struggle with mechanotransduction. And uh, now we know what's at the root of it. But uh, on a serious note, just trying to understand, you know, how him avoiding that sensation may, you know, lead to some other sequelae. I doubt it. But it's just important to understand that, that uh, this is a complex process and it's distributed across your whole body to a different degree, depending on the, the skin type and, and nature of the, the follicles in there, which I'm going to come back to in a second. But I, I just think underserved, nice basic story. No wonder it's in a big name journal like Cell, a real thought, thought changer. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm pleasantly surprised by the Nobel Prize prizes for this year in medicine. I think, you know, this is a bit of a tangent. And of course, this is a fantastic story. And I'm glad we were able to highlight it. But I did want to take a bit of a tangent to uh, some of the controversy about the potential Nobel Prize. Everybody thought it was going to be awarded to the, the folks associated with mRNA, right? But, you know, I think it's going to happen. Uh, it's going to be within the next few years, next five to 10 years. I'm thinking about CRISPR, right? The Nobel Prizes for CRISPR took you know, about 10 years to be handed down to Dr. Doudna and Dr. Shempat Charpentier, right? So it's going to happen. But certainly Dr. Julius and Dr. Padaputin are very deserving for their incredible work on mechanics transduction, don't you think? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to get out there and just say it's going to be next year. Uh, yeah. but I will have to wait and see on that. Um, but, you know, forget about, you know, world changing stuff like vaccines or fundamental insights. Like, what is it about touch? I want to get to the real nitty gritty important stuff. What the hell is happening to my hairs, the hairs on my head? And uh, many of us, Arun, I don't know about you, you're still quite dashing, a uh, young man still <laughs> for the time being. We'll see how that goes. But I mean, as you age, it's inevitable, my man. Um, your hair thins. Um, and this is about the follicle, okay? One of the best stem cell systems out there. And this is a story from my great friend and colleague, Ting Chen, who was a, a NICIF Druckenmiller fellow with me. Um, uh, my hat's off to you, Ting. It's a, it's a great story. Uh, it's about the hair follicle, right? The, the, the whole point of the hair follicle is to create the hair shaft and to make me look good in my youth, not so much anymore. Um, and that's a cycle. Uh, there's the growth phase, antigen, regressive phase, catagen, and then there's the resting phase, uh, telogen. And the perpetuation of that cycle requires the hair follicle stem cell, of course, which live at the bottom uh, in the bulge region, right? And the bulge 
is the niche essentially for the hair follicle stem cell and has three layers to it. Okay, there's the stem cells themselves, they're in the outermost layer. And then there's the hair shaft, right, which goes through the center. And then there's a layer of uh, these KRT, uh, KRT6, keratin 6 positive cells that are in between, right? The point is here is that the hair shaft itself is dead, you know, it's acellular. So as up to now, there hasn't really been a, a regulatory role assigned to it because it's not like, you know, creating anything um, in and of itself. It doesn't have DNA, it doesn't have cells. Um, but uh, there have been some observations and correlations that, uh, that hair chef miniaturization often correlates the, with the loss of hair follicle stem cells in um, all kinds of skin pathologies, um, including adro androgenic alopecia and aging itself, if you call that a pathology. So there is that correlation and, and the hair shaft, um, it occupies pretty much the majority of the hair follicle stem cell niche space, right? So you can surmise that a change in the diameter of the hair shaft, uh, it's gonna directly affect the niche, right? Uh, mechanically, physically. Um, but uh, as of yet, whether hair shaft miniaturization plays an actual causal role in hair follicle stem cell loss in uh, in vivo context is, is unknown. Um, and that's where Ting came in. Ting is, uh, she, you know, is now back in China, at the National Institute of Biological Sciences where she's killing it. Um, and this story, what I think was the linchpin here was they had this hair plucking assay and it takes like, you gotta do something totally different in order to gain the insight. And I think a lot of people would have said, well, how are you gonna even model a mechanical, la, 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 la you take the hairs out and you put them back in. I mean, that's what they did. It was amazing. Look into the methods. I'm not doing it justice. But the point being here is they use this in combination with a lot of other assays. I don't want to pay it short shrift. Um, you know, it was, you know, in, intravital imaging, a whole thing, a whole, you know, a spate of assay. Um, and what they showed is that it's actual mechanical compression of the hair follicle stem cells that causes the apoptosis. And that cell compression, the mechanical compression, activates this mechanosensitive channel, piezo-1, uh, that Arun introduced. And that triggers calcium influx, um, sensitivity to TNF-alpha that uh, hair follicle stem cells are typically resistant to. And that is what causes apoptosis. And that as you get this persistent miniaturization of the hair shafts with aging and with other uh, pathologies and genetic diseases, you get this continuous apoptotic loss through piezo. And so that's that. I mean, I think, you know, apart from the fact that maybe we could try and target this and save our hair, which is, I think, maybe, I don't want to call it low hanging fruit. It's a big idea, a big market for that. I think really the key here is demonstrating that there's this acellular quote unquote dead structure um, that plays a pivotal role in this mechanosensory axis governing uh, hair loss um, in both you know, normal aging as well as uh, more serious pathology. So hats off to you again, Chen uh, Tang. This is a, a great uh, story and uh, I'm so glad you're doing so well. We got a chat. Let's have a drink in the post COVID era one of these days. Hopefully sooner rather than later. I think we're coming to the end knock on wood knock on wood but yes yet another story about mechanic transduction here and in particular piezo the piezo channels uh in uh, part discovered and fleshed out by dr patabutian over there at scripps um the scripps institute but yeah i mean it's it, it makes me think a little bit about some of the model systems that we've actually talked about on the show, um, different model systems to study hair development. Remember the, the lymphatic papers that we had discussed? Uh, in fact, even Dr. Carl Kohler's work that he talked about, uh, he's now at Harvard and previously at Indiana. Perhaps he can use some of his hair growing organoids to model some of these mechanotransduction signaling pathways. I think uh, that's the cool thing about the, the world we live in right now, you can think of so many different new technologies they can use to dissect some of these basic fundamental questions. I will say though, uh, certain things in biology still really, really impress me. And figuring out mechanotransduction in an in vivo system is one of those things. We actually talked uh, 
about something else that actually is really impressive, impressive to me. And that's looking at uh, extracellular vesicles, exosomes, right? And how you can even interrogate that in an in vivo system just kind of blows my mind. So, hey, hats off to these amazing scientists, the, the incredible new technologies that we have that can help dissect some of these, you know, mechanotrans transduction pathways. Yeah, you know what I'm still looking for, speaking of mechanical transduction and piezo one, I'm still looking for that hematopoiesis story, Arun. Do you remember that story? Yeah. Is that story, George escaping. Come on, drop it on us. I'm hoping it it, it turned up. Yeah. Because, I remember uh, we were we were so hyped about oh, that story at ISCR. So, I have a bad feeling for about it, but I'm 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 my fingers <laughs> are still crossed. It's been a while, but these things take time. So I'm I'm holding out mechanical transduction. And, uh, you know, all the, uh, the mechanism underlying it, it's the story of the year, it seems so far. Yeah, absolutely. And shifting over a little bit to away from mechanical transduction and more towards the evolutionary development side of things, maybe a, you know, a call back to the first paper that we talked about. Uh, this next paper is going to stay sort of in the neuro side of things. We're talking about a cis acting structural variation at the ZNF558 locus controlling a gene regulatory network in human brain development. This is a cell stem cell paper that's actually coming out of the lab of Dr. Johan Jakobsen, who was a recent guest on the show. First author here is Pia Johansson. And we're talking about the evolutionary differences between primates. Okay. You know, we talked about, we talked a little bit about this on the show and how you can use organoids to actually study some of these evolutionary differences. The simplest approach is you take iPSCs from say chimpanzees and humans, which is kind of what they did here, turn them into cortical organoids and examine how those cortical organoids differ in terms of their overall development. And of course, shout out to the various pioneers in cortical organoid differentiation and development, like of course, Dr. Madeline Lancaster, Sergio Pasca, et cetera, for really pushing forward these technologies and uh, thinking about, you know, bringing them to the forefront so that we can use these technologies in this evolutionary evolutionary development context. So we're talking about the human forebrain and how it's actually really expanded in size and complexity over the years, which you know enables us to have huge brains. Part of the reason that we can be on the show and talk to talk science with you is because of our amazing brains. Well, maybe not my brain, maybe Dalen's brain, but you get what I'm going with this, right? Humans have big brains and there's a reason, there's an evolutionary reason as to why that happened. And we're still trying to figure out genetically what are the various contributions of different gene regulatory networks, pathways, et cetera, that contribute to large human forebrains, right? And here they're looking at a particular transcription factor called ZNF558 that's actually expressed in human but not chimpanzee forebrain neuroprogenitor cells. And so this transcription factor apparently evolved as a suppressor of certain line one transposons, but has actually been co-opted to focus on a single target, this mitophagy gene, SPATA18. And so there's this connection between these three gene pathways that ultimately plays a role in mitochondrial homeostasis. And if you have a loss of function uh, in cerebral organoids derived from human IPS, uh, you can alter the expression and the developmental timing of the, uh, of the ZNF558. All right. And the expression of the ZNF558 is actually controlled by some variable tandem repeats. And the important thing here is these repeats are longer in the chimps than compared to humans. The other important thing to note is we're mostly talking about the non-coding portion of the genome here, right? The quote unquote junk genome, which is not junk as we know by now, 98% of the genome is non-coding, but that doesn't mean it's not important. Just like in this context, there are these tandem repeats that are outside of a coding region, but they're still playing a really important role in the development of these cortical organoids. So don't hate on the non-coding portion of the genome, Dalen. I, I got to say, like, in my training and in my genetics training, I've always been biased towards the coding portion of the genome, but there's so much data out there showing that now these non-coding portions of the genome are not only important for brain development, but also a variety of other developmental processes. So it's a, it's another cool story. It is integrating cortical organoids in an Evo Devo context. And I actually, one question I do have is about the IPS 
chimpanzee lines because i'm sure that's really tough to do i'm talking to people who are making ipscs from a variety of different animal species it it's it's tough enough making ipscs from humans in some contexts we've got it kind of refined now but to make chimp ipscs i, I can't imagine that that's easy can't be easy none of the stuff in this paper is easy they did so much i'm very intimidated by this and other all, all the evo devo stuff for me is so hard to uh to you know conceptualize to 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 you almost need a leap of the imagination you know to get into that space in between uh the species all these animals that are now gone you know the the line between the the chimpanzees and the human evolutionarily it's, it only lives in the imagination and the imaginations of these scientists i mean i heard about you arun that your four brain was so big they're going to call it a five brain is that right <laughs> <laughs> sure why not we'll go not with that surprising i mean you really <laughs> you dug deep on this uh uh brain science brain development here i mean yeah this is just another example of how we're leveraging all sorts of uh technologies here including the organoids ips everything in the last 10 years that's gonna get or has won a nobel prize leverage it here for this uh cell stem cell story so beautiful beautiful work very impressive Big brain science, man. That's what this is. But yes, I did want to bring it back to that chimpanzee IPSC note that I brought up. And indeed, if you look at the limitation of the story, uh, they actually straight up say it's really tough to do this, in part because there are apparently shipment restrictions with actually sending some of these samples around the world. I can't imagine anything is easy in the in the age of COVID. But yeah, I mean, if you can have more than, say, 10 chimp IPSC lines uh, down the road, that would be useful. And in fact, this reminds me of a conversation we had with Dr. Jean Loring, who was one of the, the guests on the show, who's actually interested in making those IPSC zoos. Remember that? Making mm -hmm. IPSCs from a variety of different animal species, maybe using it to, to save the white rhino, for example. So Hey, there's a lot of interest in generating generating iPSCs from a, a number of different species out there. That's a good segue for me here, Arun, because I got a story about, you know, the differences between species and how there's now an impetus to generate pluripotent cells from non-traditional species in order to understand fundamental mechanisms. And here we're talking about the rabbit and primordial germ cells. Okay, this is a story from Azim Sarani, who's kind of the godfather of primordial germ cell uh, biology. Uh, he, he was one of the early entrants, uh, uh, trained uh, Mitsunori Saitu, did a lot with the pluripotent stem cells and differentiations of primordial germ cells. In this story, uh, he's at the Wellcom at Cambridge, but he uh, came in evens with uh, Toshihiro Kobayashi and Masumi Hirabayashi, who were both in Japan. Uh, and this is a story about germ cells, as I said, the specification of primordial germ cells, which are the precursors of sperm and eggs. Um, the reason why we're interested collectively is because it's a, a critical branch point where you get a, a epiblast, a pluripotent cell versus the germline. Um, so it's like a kind of somatic versus germline uh, branch there. Uh, and this is an important paradigm for understand, understanding fundamentally uh, cell state transitions that occur during early development as epiblast cells exit pluripotency. Um, and, you know, apart from understanding how we might be able to make primordial germ cells and gametes, perhaps, although I would argue that that's unlikely to ever happen uh, for clinical use. Um, it's just really important for understanding how cells change into other cells for regenerative medicine. Um, and regenerative therapies as well. And uh, the thing is, is that in rodents, uh, embryos develop as egg cylinders, um, whereas humans and non-human primates, uh, as well as many other animals, they develop as bilaminar discs, right? So there's really a, a, a very fundamental difference uh, in the way that we develop at the earliest stage, this gas relation stage where everything happens really. Um, most things happen. Earliest, uh, most complex thing happens. Um, and in humans, uh, the specification of PGCs occurs in these discs at around week two to three, right? Um, so 
the other difference being, and obviously there's a timing difference in mice just because of the developmental timing, the two, but also there's like gene differences. SOC17, which is a important regulator and master regulator, multiple cell types. It's critical for specifying human PGCs, but it's not really relevant in mice for this process. So like, this is a basic mechanistic difference. Um, and, you know, it speaks to the, the, the mysteries surrounding human primordial germ cell, cell development in vivo, because we don't really have an appropriate model, right? Because non-human primates, they're really costly and restricted accessibility. A room was just talking about you can't even ship the cells. I mean, wow. Um, also singletons, right? For the most part. So you can't really get a lot of them. And of course, because these are non-human primates, higher, the quote unquote, um, animals, they, there's justifiable ethical scrutiny, right? Then there's the rabbit, okay? Who knew about the rabbit? They have a really short gestation period, relatively short. Uh, they have litters, multiple fetuses, um, and, and they develop as bilaminar discs. You know, you didn't know that. I wouldn't have known that until I read this paper. Um, and most of all, here's a critical thing in terms of practicality, the rabbit embryo, it doesn't implant until after gastrulation begins. So it's a floating, free floating embryo where you can see processes that take place during gastrulation. Um, you don't have to unpack it from the uterus, right? Which makes it essentially impossible. Um, so what uh, Sarani and Kobayashi and Hirabayashi did here is they showed that these rabbit, I mean, it's pretty straightforward story. They showed that these rabbit um, uh, primordial germ cell like cells um, well, the primordial, bona fide primordial germ cells, they occur at the posterior epiblast, at the onset of gastrulation, so it's a time when it's, it's accessible, um, pre-implantation in, in the rabbit. Um, and then they generate, here we go, they generate rabbit pluripotent stem cells and show that they can get induction of these primordial germ cell-like cells in vitro using a Wnt and BMP combo. Um, showing that SOC17 is a critical regulator. And why is that important? Because it looks like not only in the bilaminar disc, but also in that the, the molecules involved, the signaling factors and transcription factors involved seem to be closer to, to the human, non-human primate than to the, to the rodent. It suggests that the rabbit may be a really useful uh, model for exploring these processes moving down the line. And that's pretty much it. A nice story in cell reports from one of the godfathers, godparents of... Uh, primordial germ cell biology and, uh, you know, a nice, uh, I think, capstone to his long career with his collaborators. Yeah, really cool, basic uh, developmental reproductive biology study here. It tells you something about rodents versus rabbits and how useful rabbits may actually be in modeling some of these early developmental processes. It's a little scary to me and not, you know, as somebody who's not directly involved in this field. Uh, this paper is suggesting that, yeah, there are these tremendous differences between mammalian species that, you know, haven't really diverged too long ago. Like we're not that different from mouse versus being much more different from reptiles, for example, right? But even in our own small mammalian evolutionary tree, there are these tremendous, tremendous differences in how, you know, we grow from the embryonic stage. And I think finding that right model system to, to study human development is, is so critical. And perhaps this is part of the reason why some of these new model systems like the gastroloids, et cetera, all these cool things that we talked about uh, on our various ISSCR episodes, maybe part of the reason why they may be the true next step for studying human early embryonic development. Because if you're, if, if you want to study human development, maybe you got to use human tissues, right, Dylan? Oh boy, that's risky. I mean, but I think absolutely <laughs> true. One of the first things that uh, my uh, cherished mentor, Dr. Ali Bruvanlu, told me when I became a trainee of his in, at Rockefeller University in grad school was there is no substitute for human cells and human tissues to study uh, human development. Um, and that was very, very controversial at the time. And I always tell my trainees, to your point, Arun, that um, there's nothing among the organ systems in the body that are more bizarre between closely related species than reproductive uh, apparatus. You know, reproduction, it's whatever works. That's the thing. And the crucible that governs reproductive success can be enough to carry that on for the species. Whereas, you know, a heart 
has been refined over eons and it pretty much works well the way it works within a, an order of animals. So um, that's a great point, Arun. And I, I think that there really is no other way to unravel the mysteries of human germ cell biology uh, than using uh, human material. And lucky for us, we're able to do that, I think, in a way that's ethically conscientious and attainable. So uh, brighter days ahead. And this is all, not all, but in large part, I think, thanks to our next guest in the institute that she represents, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine that has fostered a lot of the science that uh, underlies the advanced knowledge. But before we get to that, I have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. Take your human pluripotent stem cell cultures further with MTeaser Plus from Stem Cell Technologies. The most widely published medium for feeder-free human ES and IPS cell maintenance is now formulated for enhanced performance and versatility. MTeaser Plus reduces medium acidosis for more stable cultures all weekend long. To learn more, visit www.stemcell.com slash mteaser plus. That's mteaser, P-L-U-S. All right, everybody. On this episode, we have a very special guest, the president and CEO of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, Dr. Maria Milan. Dr. Milan is a president and CEO of the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Like I just said, under her leadership, CIRM continues to drive the mission of accelerating stem cell treatments to patients with unmet medical needs, has now funded over a hundred, a thousand scientific programs, including 68 clinical trials and has set up critical infrastructure such as the CIRM Alpha Clinics Network. Dr. Milan is a physician scientist who has devoted her career to treating and developing innovative solutions for children and adults with debilitating and life-threatening conditions, both as a transplant surgeon and in the private sector. Dr. Milan, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, Dr. Milan. And before we actually dive into your work leading CIRM, let's give our listeners a little insight into your own career path in biomedical research and clinical medicine as a physician scientist, since a lot of our listeners are indeed trainees. And here we are yet again on the Stem Cell Podcast with another Duke University connection, go Blue Devils, all three of us having done our undergrads in North Carolina. This keeps on happening, but I swear Duke does not have a hand in deciding who's coming on the show. I swear. That's true. But after Duke, we actually continued to train at some of the best places in the world for medicine, surgery, immunology, even working on xenotransplantation of all things during your time at the Harvard Medical School. So tell us a little bit about your journey through science and medicine, in particular, how your journey ultimately drew you to the promise of stem cell research and its potential for therapy. Wow. You know, it's funny you should mention Duke, because I have to say, we can start the story really at Duke because that is where the I caught the bug in terms of what the power of science would be. I think it, I'm going to disclose when I was there, and it was a lot you know earlier than you guys. I was there in the 80s, and as you know, the AIDS epidemic, um, transplantation, uh, organ transplantation was in its infancy. Um, so I was really inspired by one of my professors, Bernard Amos, who is an immunologist. Um, one of the one of the scientists who had elucidated the uh, major compatibility complex, you know, the things that account for rejection and our immune system um, regulation. So that fascinated me that this really prominent, um, at that point, pretty senior um, professor was venturing into this unknown, this black box. And so I, of course, went up to him and asked, can I go, you know, can I do research in the lab? And then the story just started from there. I did the usual things that you do as an undergrad, feed the nude mice, um, you know, culture cells, wash beakers and, you know, et cetera. But through the whole course of all this, um, it just became part of, you know, just, you know, the everyday experience and then I decided after undergrad that I was definitely going to pursue a, um, a uh, career in science and medicine. And my advisor asked me, okay, Maria, if you had to choose, because I couldn't choose whether I was going to go the PhD route or MD. And she said, um, 
I know you love both, you love the research and medicine, but do uh, you consider yourself you know, more of a people person or more of kind of a quiet person? And as an undergrad at Duke, you, you tend to become a people person if you didn't start out that way. <laughs> um, I actually am by nature an introvert, but I became enamored with, with people because it was a very social place. Um, in any case, I ended up going into medicine. Um, and then uh, after med school, went to, um, to Boston. And again, was influenced by the possibilities there. Um, in Boston, I did my residency. And during that time, this field of xenotransplantation with Fritz Bach as a, another immunology um, researcher who had just moved to Boston, I was intrigued by the possibility that we could um, make the immune system work in our favor um, to try to solve issues in terms of transplantation and end organ disease. And then I just then delved into transcriptional regulation, right? So I went from kind of this broad picture to really narrow and very focused and everything was all about an NF kappa B. And so um, then after that, it really led to me going into transplant surgery because that was kind of the culmination of translation into, uh, into this thing that I loved, which is um, being part of um, a field that could impact human health. Um, so that's, that led me to Stanford um, where I trained in transplant surgery and um, focused on pediatric transplants because that was the frontier. Um, transplant was at that point um, had become more successful clinically, good results, but pediatric transplant was a new frontier. Um, and then from there, more questions arose. I was, it was extremely gratifying and, and it's indescribable the feeling of being able to be part of that, um, you know, transforming the lives of uh, little babies. But then I also thought, what, what can we do so we don't have to subject them to such stress early on in their lives? Um, and that's when I became intrigued by the promise of cell therapy and stem cells. And so I think we can go on from there, but that's kind of teases up to where we are today uh, with the field of regenerative medicine now becoming a field. Um, and it's quite an exciting time um, to be at CERM, but to just be in science and medicine. Yeah, what an amazing arc. Um, and I think, yeah, you really captured how a, a person or a student with an interest becomes a specialist, right? I mean, everything there made sense. Every step, it was your fascination leads to your utility and expertise and excellence. And then there you are, you know, changing medicine and changing lives and for these kids. I mean, is there anything better? Um, and it's a great, I think, lead up to CERM because I, I think it's a good metaphor. One of the big things that made CERM possible, just speaking of your enthusiasm with all the science that was going on around you, one of the things that made CERM possible, I think, was that there was a, a, a similar culture of technological innovation that had taken root there at the turn of the millennium. And I'm speaking technology across the board, but specifically on the West Coast in uh, you know the dot-com type thing. Um, digitization of our world. Um, and this in combination with a really harsh regulatory and political environment, you know, specifically regarding pluripotent stem cells, that was a really potent mix for spurring action. Um, but as I said, when I think of the West Coast, I think of like the dot com and di digital era that we're in right now. Um, and also from a kind of tech and innovation perspective, it's the search for the next unicorn. Maybe that's more now in the last decade, but it, it was born of those times. So do you think that culture, if it exists outside of my imagination, maybe I'm overstating it, but do you think that culture has an influence on CIRM uh, and, and either it's, you know, with the expectations of the public who are looking around at all of these unicorns and saying, okay, CIRM, do that, or get the focus of the investigators because they're in California and they're surrounded by all this innovation. Do you think CIRM kind of mirrors that tech uh, culture of the of California and the West Coast? Well, I, I absolutely do. And as you know, um, California is also the birth of biotech, right? So that whole culture exists. And 
you know, being at Stanford, so being in Boston, which is also extremely, you know, a stimulating, innovative place, Duke was as well. I've been fortunate to be at all these different, you know, environments where it, it, it's so, um, there's, there's so much um, kind of in our everyday lives that tell us that, yes, we can do better. We can find solutions. We, you know, and, and always seeking questions. So that, that, that partnered with California as an ecosystem um, and the, the culture of, um, of, I would say, charging forward if, if, with, with a belief um, is very California. And just to, to back up, CERM is possible because of the patient advocates and the, the citizens of California hmm. who heard that there was this discovery um, where human embryonic stem cells um, were isolated and could be differentiated into any cell um, or tissue in the body. That's mind blowing. It's, it's the stuff that science fiction is made of, but it's, it, it was for real. It was published in, in the late nineties and that partnered with all of the advancements in, in, in understanding the, our, our code, right? The, the human genome project just was standing there. So of course, Californians and tech they know code, right? <laughs> like, if you have code, you can pretty much do everything. So you have that. So you have code and then you have biology. You're like, and eh, this thing, and, and then there is this, there's biology that says we can turn something. And so the, the kind of the, the, those two events in the late nineties, early two thousands, I think was fertile ground for the California advocates uh, led by Bob Klein for the initial proposition in 2004 to really rally behind finding a way that research, regardless of um, whatever the political winds may bring, and regardless of where, you know, kind of financial and budgetary concerns might be, that we can push the science forward as long as it's done in a responsible and ethical way. Hmm. So, so that's what that's what gave rise to Sermon 2004. And mind you, I, I wasn't as aware of what was going on, actually, because I was still in the OR. I was still on the wards. I was still, um, you know, doing um, uh, traditional yet cutting edge surgery um, and transplant surgery. But this was all happening. And at the same time, what intrigued me is as I was sitting there, I still remember I was sitting there at um we do what's called uh, selection meetings where we, we evaluate transplant evaluations and determine whether somebody is ready for a transplant, what the medical care is. It's a multidisciplinary team. And I was sitting there at the table and we were discussing yet another baby with an inborn error of metabolism, which is essentially often just one mutation, like one missing enzyme or dysfunction that leads to a life-threatening condition and at the same time, you know, in the literature, I was starting to read more about, you know, the um, early trials with hepatocyte transplantation, with actually just transplanting the cells rather than whole organ. And it seemed to me that that made sense. Um, and so that was kind of the first thing is like, why wouldn't this work, right? And 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 that's that that led me in my own lab to start pursuing kind of that area of research. Um, but that in itself probably wouldn't have led to me kind of venturing out into the private sector and, 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 you know, leaving my, the kind of the standard academic setting. Um, if it weren't for the fact that at Stanford, it was very natural for people to pursue these novel inventions and technologies and bring it out into the private sector when it was, you know, so lots of spin outs, you know, we were, I was surrounded by, you know, Dr. Fogarty, who at the same time he's, you know, coming up and down from the elevator is already thinking about his ne next, you know, device adventure, right? <laughs> or those who discovered like the pulse oximeter, which is like, you know, the pulse oximeter is such a, such a, a, a staple of how we, how we, you know, of hospitals or even in, you know, at home care, but it really revolutionized how we were able to safely um, transport patients from the operating room back to their rooms, right? Because you can monitor non-invasively what their oxygen levels like. So this is the setting. Um, so it, it, it really does tee you up to kind of um, pursue a mission, right? Uh, so being in the right setting to do that and seeing others do it and um, having um, 
places to go to pursue it. So in my case, I, I ventured out into a small company to do kind of, um, I would say a sabbatical leave where I wanted to find out like, how does this stuff go? Cause it's, was so foreign to me how um, drug development went. I was just a user of the, the technologies. And, and then when I started visiting some of these biotech firms, I realized these were uh, former professors and people who were also in the lab and in the clinics and, and are now involved in another aspect of uh, developing advancements for what we can put in clinical care. Um, so that's a really long-winded answer, but the answer is yes. Um, for sure, uh, that influenced a lot of things. It influenced my own trajectory. The setting um, influenced the ability to fund an entity such as CIRM. Uh, it's not only the, the, the California spirit or the culture and the success in tech and biotech, but also the political framework because there is this opportunity for citizens to put a bond initiative on the ballot. And so there, there was a mechanism for, for doing that. Um, in any case, you know, that's, that's, that is, um, you know, one of those unique circumstances and convergence of, of, uh, of you know, fertile ground, um, the will and the infrastructure, and then of course the policy that allows you to do this. Yeah, I think California is one of those special places in the world where, you know, pursuing your dreams and doing things out of the norm and, you know, going from the academic side of things to the private sector side of things, it's, it's encouraged, right? You know, failure and, you know, experimentation in that way and, and ambition is, is really encouraged. So I think, you know, that perfectly fits in to CIRM's mission as well. And we talked a little bit, you talked a little bit about hope, okay? You know, the hope that stem cell research and cell therapy actually brings to first and foremost patients and families who desperately need treatments and cures for diseases for which there are no cures and treatments in many cases. And certainly bringing treatments to patients is a big part of CIRM's vision and mission as we'll discuss in a little bit. And perhaps part of that grand hope for stem cell biology and research comes from the fact that stem cells are, by definition, like you talked about, exceptionally malleable and can be transformed into a variety of different cell types that can be used to study or treat so many of these different diseases, organ states, tissues, so on. But despite words like potential and hope being used so much in stem cell biology, it might sometimes seem to the general public that these promises of stem cells to treat so many different types of diseases, these promises can be a bit lofty, right? So talk a little bit about balancing hype and hope in the context of stem cell research and stem cell biology. What can we all do better as advocates for stem cell research to actually ensure that the public understands the realistic promise of these cells for treating diseases? Very well said, and that's an extremely important um, point, Arun. I mean, one of the things I want to first of all say that hype versus hope has been something that has been a, a kind of a challenge in terms of um, being able to appropriately kind of communicate what the progress has been in science. Um, so there are a couple of barriers to that. One is that you know the 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 ugly side of this is there are opportunists out there who are actually you know, using hijacking the terminology and the scientific progress and, and actually um, selling false hope, so-called direct to consumer stem cell tourism. And uh, FDA is starting to crack down on that. We're trying to battle it by being better about educating the public and understanding what's legitimate and what's not, what's regulated and what's not. So that's one piece. But what we can, what we can do even more about is as scientists, as physicians, as those who, who are working on this to really um, take ourselves out of our labs, out of our lecture halls, out of you know, our academic institution um, mentality and um, communicate the, our work and our progress with people in a way that, that really um, you know, resonates with what does this mean for them. Um, balancing where there are there are actually successes versus those that say there are successes in the lab but that could you know that this is what it could be later just kind of in a measured way so let me tell you a little bit about 
the advantage in, in being able to communicate today versus what it was in 2004. 2004, it was all hope. You know, there was just, it, it captured our imagination that, that there are these, you know, stem cells that potentially could do what you just said, either treat, cure, or um, enable us to study so that we can find cures. Today, fast forward to today, CIRM has funded over 70 clinical trials, many of them now in their late stages where they're showing efficacy, meaning that they, sh they show they work so that they're getting ready for uh, approval to be a um, product that could be more widely um, used in patients. And one of those is a cell and gene therapy that was came out of UCLA for this condition called ADA skin, adenosine deaminase severe combined immunodeficiency, which is a um, immune deficiency, the bubble baby disease, bubble boy disease, um, that, that is related to missing enzyme ADA. So Don Cohn, who's one of the, who is the PI at UCLA and his team used an approach where they were able to replace this enzyme in the hematopoietic stem cell. So this is the blood stem cells that reside within the bone marrow that give rise to the whole, all the lineages, including the immune cells. So by taking these stem cells, engineering them with gene therapy to put back the enzyme and then transplanting those into co to conditioned babies. So they, have, they were conditioned to make room to receive the stem cells. These cells engrafted and gave rise to a full immune system. So 40 babies, have shown that they have restored immune system, many of them out over five years cured. So that's a case where it's not just hype and it's, it's definitely not hype and it's not just hope, but it's, it's an actual result of years and years of research, um, both in um, elucidating kind of the genetics behind this as well as cell therapy. And then of course the other stuff in between, which is how do you translate this into a product Right, so that is in the final stages toward FDA approval. Um, there are cases where we've had patients treated with similar um, approaches for other diseases, su such as sickle cell disease. So another thing about CIRM is that we are fortunate that we can partner with other entities such as the NIH. So that the, the Heart, Lung, Blood Institute of the NIH partnered with us on cell gene therapy cures. It's a sickle cell cures initiative because they agreed with the, you know, not just the promise, but the near term um, um, potential for cure of sickle cell, which results from a single mutation that we've, we've known about the molecular basis disease for decades, but now we have the we should we have the technology, right? So it's like my Steve Austin, you know, um, we have the technology, we can rebuild it. But but the thing is, like, and especially like think about it. So Jennifer Downer is just down the street at Berkeley um, with CRISPR Cas9 technology. We have our researchers who are bone marrow transplanters looking with different ways of gene therapy. We have a collaboration of all these groups and CIRM is funding this program with CRISPR-Cas9 correction of, um, it's already in the clinical stage. So as soon and so the progress and science is, has really been um, amazing these past several years, but all of the foundational biology and infrastructure have been in place so that we can now take it and build upon that to progress and accelerate um, the progress of these discoveries into therapeutics. Um, it's, it's, it's a whole, it's, it's, um, I'd encourage the, the listeners to go to the CIRM website to just kind of take a look at all the different programs that have been funded. We actually have a clinical trial dashboard with the 75 trials that describe it and links and everything else. It's tough to kind of cover it all in one conversation but it spans a gamut of indications, um, including um, cell therapies for um, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, where in that case, it's a, it's a different kind of mechanism of action. It's not a replacement per se, but it is about stimulating um, the environment of, you know, um, to um, either a slow down degeneration or to initiate repair or to, um, attract 
um, the cells into the environment for repair. Uh, so um, I can't re even remember what we started off with, hope versus hype. The thing about this is that it's based on real science, so it's not hype. So, okay, it may not work in the first iteration or it may not work in one year or two years, but the kind of, it's based on biology, which is something that really distinguishes it, it in some ways from traditional drug development. The tr traditional drug development with, uh, with um, small molecules, for instance, where you screen a bunch of um, compounds, you know, it's in a directed way, you make sure that it's not toxic, you kind of have a sense of its activity, and then you start kind of looking into it further and develop it as a potential drug. Sometimes you don't even know that specifically the mechanism of action, but you know it has the end result that you want, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas kind of with these cell and gene therapies, it's coming from the other direction. You're looking at what is a pathophysiology, what is it you're trying to impact, and you, now you're developing and designing an approach to that root cause. So it's really amazing how it's created um, more opportunities for uh, scientists, researchers to kind of approach diseases in different ways. And as you said, um, many unmet medical need, many um, many disease states that are that still remain to be understood. Um, now we have many more tools and approaches um, on hand that are by the day being developed. Yeah, I mean the. You said it there. It's it's a it's a different type of uh, approach, right? It's logic based. There's a rationale. It all makes sense, but it does take time, right? Because you know you got to iron out a lot of the kinks, um, and it requires the patience of the public. I think in this case, because they're uniquely attuned to the potential of these therapies, um, and you can hardly blame them. Uh, for being distracted by the latest, you know, technological or therapeutic marvel that's in the, the general news cycle. You know, it's a long game. Um, and you I think I, that's absolutely right, Dale. And I wanted to just ca uh, to capitalize on what you just said <laughs> because it just brings to mind a, a, a story, if it's okay with you. Yeah, of course. It is a long game, but I, I, I want to tell you a story. Um, I actually did a, a similar type of conversation with uh, Derek Rossi, who you, you may be familiar with, right? Um, as the co-founder of Moderna, um, who, has, uh, who uh, developed one of the first vaccines to COVID, mRNA vaccine. So Derek was a postdoc in Herb Weissman's lab at Stanford way back when, in the early days of CIRM. And as a molecular biologist, he actually, that was his first um, kind of, I think that's his entry into the stem cell field was in that, um, in that lab. And he actually was a CIRM, what we call a CIRM scholar. He got, a, he got an award um, that supported some of his research. But in the course of being a stem cell biologist, he um, started working with mRNA, I'll tell you this, because he was trying to find a more efficient way to reprogram cells. So instead of using embryonic stem cells to be able to take, you know, the Shinya Yamanaka um, um, protocol, which relied on the four fact, the factors to reprogram mature cells back to the pluripotent state, and um, was trying to improve that with uh, stabilization and, uh, of the process using mRNA. And that's when he started doing his research with mRNA. And then when he got a faculty position um, at, at Harvard, the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, that was, that was something he developed in his lab. And then that was spun out. Did he know that that was going to be the technology along with the work that was happening at Penn at the same time um, that led to the BioNTech Pfizer mRNA vaccine? Did they know that at that time that that was going to be the technology that was deployed and would be able to give a vaccine in, in, in record time within 10 months of being able to show clinical data with, with a novel technology against this horrendous pandemic? Um, no, so, and yes, it does take patience, but the thing is, it's not always a linear path. And so these discoveries on their own have a life of their own, right? So they, it, we don't know when it's going to be used and for, for specifically what application sometimes, but the idea is that you're pushing forward and you're basing it on good science. Um, and so I think that, that that's a story I love to tell because it is, it is so current, right? Where it's top of mind. And it also um, 
is an example how, of how the public can be receptive to discussing science because, you know, everybody knows what the COVID's a virus. I mean, we have so many virologists and epidemiologists walking around now in our neighborhoods. Like we didn't know they all existed because everybody is so is reading so much about everything, right? And then mRNA, it rolls off the tongue of everybody, mRNA, right? So it is possible to communicate with the public. It, it un, Unfortunately, in this case, it was un, under unfortunate circumstances, but we can do it. Yeah, it's a great story. And it's a story about the power of basic science and the power of funding basic science and the importance of funding basic science, which of course, CIRM has done for 15-ish years now. Yes, it has been there. <laughs> Time flies. Time does fly, certainly. But yeah, it's been 15 years since, more than 15 years since the start of CIRM. And, you know, I was back in high school back in those days, <laughs> but originally born out of the passage of Proposition 71 back in 2004. And of course, last year we had Prop 14 that was passed uh, to, to help renew CIRM. And of course, the, the people of California voiced their opinion and decided to make the Golden State, the place to be for stem cell research in the world. And I'm a little biased, of course, since I've done most of my stem cell training here in California. But I think CIRM is really one of a kind, right? It's in addition to bringing a tremendous amount of basic research, like what we're talking about, and translational stem cell research funding and focus to the state. It's also trained an entire workforce of people, myself included, in regenerative medicine over the last decade plus. So, you know, thank you for that. Um, well, your story is incredible <laughs> on its own. So I, I hope you did a podcast on you too. <laughs> I think we've already had one of those, but happy to do a follow-up too. Um, so yeah, CIRM has been so incredibly influential in the lives of patients and trainees like myself. But if you had to talk about some of the greatest victories that CIRM has had so far, I mean, you talked about Don Cohn's work, some of the ADA SCID clinical trials that are you know really incredible and incredible in terms of the results that they're bringing. But in addition, some of the other victories, both scientifically, medically, or otherwise, what, what would you say CIRM's greatest hits have been? I think greatest hits, you just, one of them was what you just said, is, is, is actually give rise to a whole new generation of scientists and leaders in the field. Um, so there are a variety of different research programs. So that is very unique that CIRM can point to. And, and we were so proud, Arun and other, you know, we have stem cell uh, trainees who come out from everywhere and they were Bridges students uh, that which, or even Spark students from high school. And they've, they've, they're, um, they're um, uh, carrying on um, with various um, kind of branches of research that started with that early experience. That's spectacular. Um, even five years ago, so the another greatest hit, even five years ago, there wasn't a lot of industry interest in CERM and that's um, in, in stem cell research. And that's why CERM existed was to de-risk and to, to fund across the valley of death for these promising science that really had no, no um, go-to source for funding. You know, it wasn't, some of this work wasn't appropriate for the NIH. Some of the translational research really wouldn't, you know, score really well. In, in a in a in a um, NIH um, uh, competitive round because it wasn't sciencey enough, but it was important to important work to take a scientific discovery into a potential clinical product, um, and also industry and, and investors. It was too risky. So five years ago, part of our strategic plan was to increase industry pull. And um, we measured maybe a couple of hundred million dollars in, in partnership events at that time when we started this in 2005-ish. Um, and then from in, over the past five, six years, we've had at least what we can measure about $18 billion worth of investment into the various portfolio programs, either by way of um, acquisition, licensing, um, IPOs, follow-on financing, and it and and it keeps giving. You know, in terms of some programs that just got their start, grew to such proportions that they're now um, out there in in kind of the larger uh, large cap um, company. Um, and at that point, it's no longer CIRM. CIRM is not intended to take everything all the way through, but it's intended to, to um, take the promising science and de-risk them. So I think that's another uh, one of the greatest hits. 
of course, the, the trials and the discoveries and the patents and all of the um, infrastructure that's been created to support basic research, such as um, creation of the world's largest induced pluripotent stem cell bank with over 2,400 well-characterized lines that were all derived in a standard fashion. Um, the genomics initiative, which led to a stem cell um, uh, characterization and, and a whole host of projects, terabytes of data generated and a starting point for what we believe in the future will be really valuable if we can, you know, kind of put this all together. Um, and then the economic stimulation that it's created for the state in terms of jobs created um, and tax revenue is in a, on a practical level. So I think, and then what I didn't mention was with Prop 14, you know, there are additional focuses, um, including how do we make this accessible and affordable to the public and to underserved communities and to all sectors in need. So there's gonna be another dimension to CIRM in terms of how we can do this in an informed fashion. Um, yeah, so I think that's, I'm sure I'll come up with more, but for now, I think those are, I would say at the top of my greatest hits for CIRM. Yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, there's a long list there behind that, I'm sure. And I want to circle back, or maybe Arun will circle back to the the uh, the future. You know, what what's what's in store with Prop 14? You alluded to a bit there, but first, I want to get to something maybe a little distasteful, but I'm sure is a lot of people's minds. Um, you know, you talk about victories. It's a victory for me every time I get a paycheck. You know, I know I'm doing my job. I know I'm going to be able to feed my family and subsist for a short while longer in the city of New York. But, um, you know, in a serious note, uh, I know scientists are accustomed to just asking for money with no guarantee of return. Um, and that's what's important, right? You got to fund basic science. But um, many may forget that the uh, Prop 7, 71 and, and 14 are, were predicated on a financial return in the form of royalty checks on the uh, when these things are outlaid. Of course, it's too early to appreciate like what the long-term commercial returns are on the whole broad portfolio of certain funded projects. But do you have any data there on what to expect? Or, like how does it scale to the investment? You know, billions of dollars, like how does it get whacked up? Um, and where does the money go? Like that royalty money, does it go back into the pocket of the taxpayers? Can you just elaborate on that for us a bit? I want to first say that what, what that was a really good point you made in terms of basic scientists just need to be able to do the basic science, right? Even if let's say there aren't returns on it because it's important on its own. So we need to have a way to support that because that is the starting point for everything. That is where the pipeline comes from. You know, good medicine starts with strong science. So thank you for saying that. And I, we don't say that enough. Uh, it's really the whole thing works together. The second part about um, return to the state. So CIRM um, has a pretty unique way of, it's not intended to be a revenue generating, it's not a company. We, we don't intend to grow through, through revenue generation. We don't own IP. Um, we, the, the, those who we fund retain their IP and retain their freedom to operate, to, to, to make the most of it. But what we do have is revenue sharing where, um, the current regulations are that if um, programs that were funded by CIRM go on to become products and, and um, earn revenue, then there is um, a royalty provision with a formula that is owed back to the, to the state. That comes back to the state of California. But one other piece of that is that the, under Prop 14, the returns to the state are now to be earmarked for the purposes of making this affordable and, and um, accessible to California citizens, making the technology that has arisen. So that is a new feature, which is spectacular. So it'll go right back to the citizens for, you know, instead of going into the general fund, coming specifically to for that purpose. Mm -hmm. In terms of scale, it could be huge. I'll come back in a year or so and hopefully have even more you know, to, to share because there'll be public information. But I have to say that um, of that 18 billion in, in investment that I told you about, those many of those programs are now in larger commercialization companies in, in the final stages, 
Some of them have breakthrough designations. Um, and so they're, they're, they're I would say, um, continuing to make their way toward commercialization. Um, and so that's when we'll, we'll really start seeing returns. We're already starting to see them coming in and I'll be able to disclose more of that in a bit, but they're in progress um, coming from the academic licenses. But then when, when it hits the companies and they're able to make this more accessible um, worldwide, then we'll really start to see the returns uh, back to the state. Yeah, I guess we'll have to stay tuned for that. I guess we'll have to call you back on the show next year so that you can uh, provide an update. Shameless. Uh, I'm trying to get an invitation back already. <laughs> well, you're welcome back anytime, I got I to gotta say. And speaking of the future, so, you know, CIRM has, of course, been given new life with the passage of Prop 14 late 2020 as part of the elections last year. We actually talked with Dr. Kelly Shepard at CIRM uh, a while back about how all of us in the field, and in particular here in California, we're anxiously awaiting this decision. And if I was a nervous wreck waiting for the results, I can't imagine how tense it must have been in the CERM offices as those Prop 14 votes were being tallied. But indeed, Prop 14 did pass and the people of California have enabled CERM's mission to continue into the future. And I know that the focus this time is very much on bringing treatments to patients, right? Like what we've talked about, but what steps has CIRM taken to ensure that these cell and stem cell based treatments become a reality clinically? And through it all, how do you balance prioritizing these translational therapies while still maintaining that really strong basic science portfolio that we talked about? So kind of tell us about this vision for the, the newest version of CIRM. Aha. Uh -huh. So, um, just by chance, next week, I'll be presenting in a public meeting a draft strategic plan for CIRM going forward. It's hmm. our five-year strategic plan with a long-range vision. Um, and then that the intent is that the final strategic plan will be approved by the board uh, in December. And what happens, just to give you a little bit of the workings of CIRM, is if once the board agrees on the direction of the strategic plan, then we, stole, we roll out new programs by way of... Um, funding opportunities or other means, right? And so that is, um, I'll just put that teaser out, but I will tell you that what the strategic plan will have is a strong commitment to the long game with continuing to fund um, basic research, continuing to build on the translational machinery um, that CIRM is very well known for, funding um, through our funding mechanism, accelerating, we have, the, we have acceleration on a business level and how funds get, get out there on, our, on how we run operations so that there's a continuous and recurrent um, funding opportunities so, so that when, when things are ready, they can come in, they can come back if they need to be um, um, you know, more responsive to the reviewers, but then they have a chance to get funded several months down the road. So it's very, very much a, a kind of a machinery. Um, we have advisory that um, advisory panels that help our translational clinical stage programs to accelerate um, and increase the probability of success. Our, our payments are based on milestones that are ver very real. And so what happens is people keep on track. There's, you know, shared expectations. Um, and we will, of course, continue to fund clinical trials. Um, in addition, we, are, we have already incorporated into our funding a couple of things. Um, one is a starting point for how we bring uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in terms of how every aspect of how research is conducted, the research materials, the approach, the questions, are they, are they taking into account the whole population that could be affected by a particular disease. Um, the, the culture of the teams, diverse perspectives. So this is already being embedded into our programs, into our applications, into peer review, and into our board consideration for funding. So that's pretty amazing. The other piece of it is we have um, incorporated into our funding mechanism a, a a um, requirement that our grantees describe their data sharing plan. And that's just a starting point. What we envision is to not have a draconian or, 
or um, or uh, draconian or unreasonable requirements, but to provide a way that we can help our researchers really tap into the broader uh, data set that that currently, unfortunately, still um, lie in silos or are inaccessible or are lost. And because when you think about things as a project to project, you know, on a project to project basis, one success, it's great for that project, but how do we lift all boats? How do we make this accessible to the whole ecosystem in a way that still protects the interest of, of the researchers and, and privacy, obviously, of, of patients? So data sharing, building of knowledge networks is a very real goal for us. That is, that is, not, that is something that, that we've been talking about, so it's not new, but we will be kind of rolling out um, you know, uh, general ideas of how we're doing this. But it's in the background, that's being worked on. We're assembling KOLs. We're looking at strategies that, that could make this a reality. Um, all of this, all serving the mission of how can we support the science, um, accelerate and make, get, gain the most value for, for the investments into the science in terms of the output. Um, scientific knowledge cures, therapies. Um, so that is kind of the, the vision and you will see that kind of roll out over the next couple of months. In addition, to look at our infrastructure. Some of these were actually built into Prop 14, just to let you know, expansion of our, of our clinical network. I didn't mention that we funded um, a, what's called the Alpha Clinics Network, which is the, the first of its kind, stem cell regenerative medicine focused clinical trial networks. Um, and it is kind of a holistic um, uh, application of this. It's clinical care, research, and also training. Um, so expansion of that, as well as creation of community care centers of excellence that could, you know, so that brings it out into the communities. That is in Prop 14. Um, the concept of shared labs, next generation, is in Prop 14, where we can build these knowledge networks, but also have the, the ability to democratize kind of the advancements by creating these shared labs. So the researchers whether they be in less established or more established institutions that don't have access to a particular technology, but that's the key thing that could help bring their research along, they would have the opportunity to, to access that. So those are all kind of the, 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 um, the high level um, concepts that are being developed. It's been things that have been described at board meetings. You know, it's, we're developing it along with our stakeholders. Um, academic industry, patient groups, our, our board, KOLs outside of California, um, key opinion leaders worldwide. So we're really excited about the opportunity to do that um, under Prop 14. Yeah, it's so exciting that this was renewed, this new bolus and commitment, um, because it's like the next gen, the second generation, I feel like is always far superior to the first you know because any mistake that you made and also in the meantime the culture has evolved the technology has evolved and now it's really exciting to see that the things that were started long ago are starting to trickle into the you know therapeutic landscape um and i mean i just can't wait to, we're gonna have to have you on pretty soon again because i just can't wait to see what's next the pace seems to be accelerating um so we will uh if you don't mind shameless Absolutely. as you are we will have you on again but before <laughs> we let you go we're going to go a little science peripheral here okay uh, with a, a few questions uh lightning round if uh you were not a physician slash scientist slash president slash ceo what do you think you might be an architect an architect. Yeah, well, it's not too late. You can get into that, you know, when your tenure is <laughs> over at the CERN. Next, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given, either professional or not? When I was a postdoc um, giving my first presentation ever, um, Fritz Bach said to me, he was my mentor, he was a scientist mentor, don't forget, you know your work and you know your data better than everybody, anybody else. So when you're in front of those thousands of people, of course, he had to mention there were thousands of people, <laughs> just know 
that you that this is your work and only you know what happened here. And I think that really speaks to me because I think, you know, I, I often hear um, students and uh, young scientists talk about, you know, the imposter syndrome and like lack of confidence and all that. And then I always say, but you know what though, you, you owe it to the world to share what you have observed, right? You might, you, you could think of a million things and catastrophize that people are gonna knock this down, but this could be the very piece of, you know, of knowledge that um, unlocks so many things. So, you know, so that's one thing. And the other thing is clarity over certainty. Mm. That there are very few things that are certain in medicine and science, anything. And it's about clarity and how you kind of look at it and go forward because it's, just, it's in the going forward that we're making progress. Um, yeah, so those are the two things. You know your work, use clarity over certainty. Brilliant. Um, finally, what is the biggest misconception about science that you would like to revolve, resolve? Sorry. Okay, so we talked about this in terms of the importance of engaging the public. We, we not just CIRM, but the scientific community, this is a partnership with the public. We couldn't do our work without the public, you know, public funding and public trust. Um, and we need to work on that. But there are some things I think sometimes get in the way. Sometimes amazing scientists who have something to say feel like if they um, express it in any other way, but is what is exact and scientific, that they are um, somehow putting at risk the integrity of that work, mm -hmm. right? And so they'll do that. And meanwhile, no one knows what they're talking about when they're in a certain audience. And so it doesn't do anything, but yes, you can do that with your colleagues, but really it does not, you're not selling out when, when you're trying to explain it, you know, to your, to the fourth grader or to your grandparents, right? You just need to, to, to meet people where they are. So that's one thing. And on the other side, from the public side, science is not something that's supposed to be a foreign language and scary. Ask the questions and, 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 and make us accountable. Um, so it, it comes from both directions. And, and I think it's only through that that we're going to make progress together. This is a partnership all the way across. Wow, great close. This is a partnership. You guys in California are partnered up nice doing some stuff. I'm over here in New York just about to freeze up but I'll be looking to you for inspiration. That's for sure. Dr. Milan, thank you so much for joining us. Great chat. Well, thank you. All right, everyone. That brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Not going to find one more notable than today's guest leading the charge in California, allocating billions of resources, of dollars and resources towards the next generation of therapeutics and cures. Very exciting. Really great to have her on. We'll see you guys or you'll hear us in a couple